Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've been invited to talk about my insights on teaching chemists with small hands. I myself have extremely small hands. I can barely reach an octave. And I never knew that I had small hands until I was about 18 years old at the Oberlin Conservatory of Music, starting to learn Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. My childhood teacher of almost 13 years never let the notion come into my mind that my small hands would get in the way of anything. I enjoyed a healthy diet of repertoire of all styles, and, and I wasn't confined to Bach, Mozart, and Debussy, the less chordal, less stretchy repertoire that small-handed pianists are often stuck with. Of course, I can play the music of Bach, Mozart, and Debussy until the cows come home, but I also want to play Prokofiev, Rachmaninoff, and Brahms. Unfortunately, the canon of piano repertoire in the Western art tradition favors large hands over small ones. Pianists with small hands immediately encounter tef technical difficulties related to hand span in advanced repertoire. But this isn't news for you. We, as teachers of children and adults with small hands, are always coming up with different coping strategies to optimize performance and minimize injury. But if I can make any point today, I'd like it to be that there are a myriad of solutions for small-handed pianists to approach any type of repertoire. So let me share with you my presentation. In coming up with this talk, I'd like to credit the work of Laura Dahl and Brenda Riston in their publication <clears throat> of Adaptive Strategies for Small-Handed Pianists as well as numerous studies on ergonomics and biomechanics, the sources which will be shared at the end of my slides. My thoughts have, of course, also been shaped by my own personality and my own experiences. My personality is um, very much a, that, uh, a, one of strong will, and I'm always a problem solver, never willing to give up. And I come from a lineage of very headstrong, positive and stubborn women who always seem to find a way. As a teacher, I'm constantly entering uncharted territories in the uh, realm of personalities, styles and hands that I come across. But my constants have always been to stay optimistic and find individualized solutions within a musical approach. Although most of the, the solutions that I'll speak about today will be focused on technique and mechanics, it's expected that the process will always start and end with the sound, the phrasing, and the expression in mind. I really hope that this information can provide some stepping stones for you in exploring solutions with your small-handed students, and not only the ability to play, the consistency of execution. So let's start with the main issues that pianists with small hands deal with. First of all, the difficulty in reaching intervals and chords. Of course, for me, I can barely reach an octave. Uh, just a ninth is a stretch for me. Four note chords and Brahms is difficult for me. And Along with that, the ability to control my sound and the sound quality is difficult when I'm reaching these intervals and chords. It restricts small-handed pianists from producing loud volumes often because of the stretch, we often get a collapsed bridge and the arm support is gone and the hand support is reduced. When you're trying to voice large chords, um, you often deal with uncomfortable situations um, because your hand is outstretched and can't do very much more in terms of flexibility. Along with that, you're constantly expending energy, both physical and mental energy, and leaping around the keyboard, right? The, um, the normal neutral hand shape should encompass the notes C, D, E, F, and G. But for me, my hand span goes from C to F, 
And so therefore, um, even just playing a simple melody relies on gauging the distances between the intervals. And so this is, this is a very important one. Also, one of the biggest problems is injury, right? Injury from stretching, injury from repetitive lateral wrist motion. And this is, of course, something that we'd all like to avoid in ourselves and our students. I suffered for about two years in my undergrad on and off from tendonitis. And often, you know, doctors would tell me, specialists rather would tell me, take some time off, you know, ice, and it had nothing to do with actually dealing with the issue, which was the stretching, right? Of course, doctors can't tell you that. Teachers are supposed to be the ones that are guiding you in this realm. Um, and even that is such a hard task because we don't feel what our students feel. And even if it looks relaxed, there still could be some amount of tension in there. The final problem, as I've already mentioned, is the, the lack of repertoire choices, um, the limitations of repertoire. So scalar things like Mozart um, are much easier than chordal music that Brahms, Beethoven, um, composers like this bring in. There's a huge body of repertoire, particularly in the Romantic period, and onwards that need larger hands, right? Liszt, Rachmaninoff, Scriabin, Ligeti, the list goes on and on and on. So my job here today is to explore some solutions with you. First, in my studies of biomechanics and ergonomics, um, my, my focus in my teaching is to always find a neutral hand position and a neutral wrist position. So an anatomically neutral position can be found when your wrist is just hanging naturally at your side. So try it out. If when your wrist, um, your, your arms are loose, you could, you know, lift your shoulders up and down a couple of times and wave your arms until they just come to a stop very very naturally. This is your neutral hand position. And this looks a little bit different for everybody. Um, but again, you can find it when you're just relaxed at your side like this. So when you are, are dealing with this neutral hand position in uh, playing repertoire that involves large intervals, how do we get there? For instance, when I'm playing the, um, the Schubert G flat impromptu, instead of right, do, um, playing with the fingering that is prescribed in the Henley edition of five and then holding the fifth finger and playing the rest of them, I change my fingering to five and then have my pedal down and then go right back down to one, two, and five. And it keeps my position in a neutral place. Of course, I'm using my pedal to do this, but it encourages jumping and keeping your hand in this neutral hand position that gives you maximum sound control rather than stretching and limiting yourself to the sound control, the voicing, the shaping of these lines. And when I'm just quickly reaching for something, I'm not reaching by stretching out so much, but I'm just reaching by jumping and trying to stay as much as I can in this neutral hand position. My former teacher, Angela Chang, she talked a lot about a, um, a cat motion. So when you throw a cat, for instance, or when a cat lands, rather, um, they kind of land like this, right? And so sh she would talk about this motion in, in um, blocked chords, in playing blocked chords. So staying as neutral as you can for as long as possible, and then splaying out at the last possible moment. And at the same time, releasing as soon as you can. So you're always coming back to a neutral position as much as you can. This also involves letting go of reaches as soon as possible, right? So again, going back to pedaling and letting go, getting back to that neutral shape as much as you can. So these are, 
um, some principles that you can use to start, right? The next step would be to start omitting and rewriting notes, or I'm sure you all have explored rolling and breaking chords, um, as well as hand substitutions. So the creative aspect of, of finding solutions in these, um, uh, in these particular topics is, is endless. Um, the, you know, I'm constantly looking at the way that editors write the music um, and display the music on staffs. And then I'm, I'm looking at the music and I'm thinking about how I want it to sound. And I'm very free in the way that I choose to split my hands or roll the chords or omit certain notes and put it into other, other chords, right? Um, I'm always fooling around with this, being creative with this process so that the, the expression, the music making can happen without being confined to what your hands are doing when playing exactly as the notes look on the page. P a pedal connection of tones is, is something that um, has been talked about so much. Uh, we, we often refer to Rubinstein's Chopin, you know, his ability to create a legato without a actual physical connection. So this is again, something that, that allows you to stay in a neutral hand position, but not using the actual physical connection, but uh, the, just the connecting of notes through the shape and the sound. This is something that I work with constantly as somebody with small hands and I'm really, um, encouraging my students with small hands to think about. It encourages um, a really um, an awareness of the sound at the present moment and a knowledge of how the sound is produced. So keeping in mind um, where you are in the shape of the phrase, right? So using the pedal to do this and not the actual physical connection is a wonderful strategy to take. As well, we always want to maximize our efficiency, to conserve resources, right? So that we can maintain safety and maintain a well-being in our playing. So this is really important for small-headed pianists. And these are all principles that you know you can be used with all kinds of hand shapes, really. But small-headed pianists really have to try to maximize the efficiency of our playing. So I'll, talk, I'll just talk about these principles quickly. So avoiding key bedding. And so this is a principle um, of, of keeping the pressure, applying the pressure after the maximum depth of the key is reached, right? This has no effect on the sound. So making sure that your students know that they can let go and again, return to this neutral position after the hammer has struck the, struck the strings, right? So not to keep bed. As well, another efficient technique is to use forearm rotation to create loud volumes. So you're using more of the speed of attack to create the volume. And this is one of the most effective ways that our upper bodies can create sound. And so if I'm wanting a lot of sound on this note that I'm placing, then I'm using my wrist, this rotation to create the sound. It's a lot quicker at, um, at depressing the key than, than an arm attack like this. Of course, we use different balances of arm and wrist and all of these things according to the context. But just to know that the forearm rotation is a really effective way of creating a um, speed of attack is a really important aspect of creating loud volumes. As well, to avoid extra gestures that waste energy, right? So, I'm going to reference long, long here, but um, so avoiding a lot of vertical motions and being really efficient and aware of all of your movement, right? Um, and this really goes, um, it supports the idea that at the piano, we are constantly forming choreography, that we're dancers at the instrument and we're in our practicing, we're practicing 
not only the creation of um, uh, phrasing and expression, but the creation of choreography, the consistency of choreography. So again, being as aware as we can about our physical gestures and being efficient is an important step of approaching repertoire that is a stretch for small-headed pianists. Another solution that I want to talk about um, has been derived in my studies of methods time management systems. This sounds rather strange, um, but it's, it's talking about getting the most product for the least amount of effort. So how can we do this? Um, so one of the one of the uh, most important sources that I've read in my studies is uh, talks about um, locating curved motions and using continuous curved motions rather than straight or sudden changes in direction. Although, as we know, the quickest way to get to a note may be a straight line, a curved gesture is much more natural in the motion. So the drop and roll technique of getting somewhere. And um, this includes groups of chords, melodic phrases, left hand accompanimental figures, right? So the opening of Petrushka, um, the, you're stretched out like this with a small hand and using that very curved gesture to get there. Or even um, the melodic leap of Beethoven's Opus 14, number two. Right, that famous jump here. Instead of going da da in a straight line, coming off in a nice curved gesture. Um, or even just the left-handed accompaniment that I was talking about, a, a waltz bass of a Chopin piece. Um, instead of moving in a straight line and often stretching, right? Um, always moving in these curved lines. It's, um, it, it remains, it gives you the most product for the least amount of effort, the most control, these gestures. So keep that in mind, these curved gestures. As well in our efforts to be efficient, the connection of from the finger to the arm. So this really helps reduce fatigue. So by evaluating when to use more small muscle movements versus more large movements is something that we're always doing. But really important is just the connection that we have. Our fingers, they're faster than our arms, but they're also weaker. Um, the strength increases from the wrist to the forearm, to the upper body, to the whole body. And the constant connection from the fingers to the large muscles and the constant changing of the ratio is really important, but always maintaining that finger to arm connection. So let me give you a couple of examples of this. When you are repeating notes, right? So if you're doing a um, repetitive gestures at a fast tempo, instead of using an arm motion like this, which is much less efficient to use your fingers in this type of technique is much more efficient, right? It, you, it expends much less energy because our fingers are much faster than our arms. Um, or when you want, this is the opposite kind of example. If you want a large sound in large chords, right? Um, playing using your large muscles in your body, right? And so, this again, this connection between the small and the large muscles, they require a, a knowledge and an awareness of what each body part does. And so I would, I encourage you as teachers to, to introduce this topic to your students um, and talk about this topic in a, in a little bit more of a scientific way, right? What our fingers are capable of, what our wrists are capable of, so that your student can make his or her own decisions when it comes to creating a choreography that we were speaking about. In this utilizing of the arm connection, the seated position is so important. So the height of the chair being adjusted so that the forearm and the wrist is slightly 
above the keyboard actually helps in this arm connection. Usually we um, hear of the, the forearm being parallel to the ground, but if you're just a slightly above the keyboard, it's forcing you to use a little bit more arm that you might use if you, than if you were seated under the keyboard. As well, the distance of the chair is such that one shouldn't have to lean so much forward or so much backwards to reach any note on the piano, right? So just positioning yourself well is really important for efficiency. Um, and it gives you maximum flexibility and maximum control over your sound. Another solution that I'd like to speak about is using strategic fingering according to the natural strengths of the fingers. So we know that the middle finger and the thumb are the strongest fingers that we have. And we also know that the index finger is the fastest. And as we know that both force and speed determine volume, it's really important to utilize these three fingers um, intelligently. Even in something as simple as um, a concerto line, I've been working on Mozart's K488 recently and the opening. Excuse my singing. <laughs> um, but instead of starting with, if I, you know, I have small hands and the weight of my fifth finger isn't, isn't very much, right? So instead of starting five, three or something, four, I start with three, one, something like this. So that I, even though the C sharp is on a, um, on a one, I'm still achieving more control over my sound and the immediacy of the speed of attack will give me much more of a singing line, especially in a concerto when you're having to, um, to project in large spaces over entire orchestras, right? So using these fingers and, um, is really crucial in the thought process. And um, again, because our fingers, people with smaller hands, they usually don't have much natural weight. So using these fingers, it's really important. In addition, using any part of the hand and finger to produce sound is a concept that I work with constantly in my studio. So not sticking to, um, you know, just using your fingers, but, you know, in terms of, I was just playing the Ravel Alborada del Grazioso, and when I needed a, a big sound on the bottom of the keyboard, I used my fist. When I'm um, when I'm looking at other you know things where I need a lot of sound, I, I use straight thumbs, and I, I play with every part of my hand and every part of my finger that I can utilize in serving the expression of the music. So please, in your exploration of solutions, don't be confined to just using, you know, the, the right parts of the finger that create a great bridge, right? Be flexible. Always encourage your students to explore the production of sound. There's no prescribed hand position in, in ex expression, right? Think outside of the rational ergonomic principle sometimes. It's always a process of first knowing what kind of sound you want and then experimenting with how to get that sound the most um, efficient way or the easiest right without practice so explore those concepts that go outside our box of the, the prescribed hand position so the next point that i make as you can see on my slide is is exploring solutions where you're you're making musical decisions that relieve tension. So again, in stretching out the hand, we're building up a lot of tension and we're building in a lot of locking positions. And so it's really important that we have places where we can let go and allow our arms to rest to avoid injury. First of all, placing importance of, on the shaping above creating the loudest volumes that we can is really important. Loud volumes are contextual, right? So I try to place importance on the hierarchy of volumes to support the peaks in the phrase. And even if you may not be 
as loud as Roger Lupu in his um, in his Brahms concerti. You know the the actual decibel level um, is not the issue here. It's the context. It's the the softs as well as the loud. So using this big range of sound is important, um, especially in pianists with small hands. And the same thought process being exponential in the sound production in crescendos, right? Save the sound for the last minute. Save your energy for the last minute. It's not only more effective in creating these climactic moments, um, it also saves energy and it saves um, tension buildup, right, in your arm. As well, a constancy of dynamic fluctuations to avoid a locked position. As a teacher, I'm always talking about um, music as having fluctuations. It's never a straight line of sounds, right? Because the way that we express, the way that we talk, the way that we hear music is always a dynamic um, expression of tones. But, but in small-handed pianists, again, if you're locked up in a large chordal um, melody, for instance, you always want to um, create a fluctuation in the dynamic so that each utterance of each chord is not at the same level and thereby not using the same muscles and not, not um, encouraging tension to build up in your arm. It avoids a locked position if you're thinking about dynamic fluctuations at all times, even in just a minimal subtle way. It really helps. Um, Dahl and Riston in their book that I referred to at the beginning of my presentation really supports voicing bass lines to contribute to the fullness and the depth of the sound. So using the acoustics of the piano to a small-handed pianist's advantage, right? Because the bass strings resonate much longer than the treble strings. And so you're using that concept to help um, the fullness of the sound. Another concept that I, I like to talk about is voicing multiple lines in a conversation. So this relieves one hand at a time when you're switching, switching the voicing, or maybe even one part of the hand at a time when you're switching your voicing, right? And um, so octaves in, uh, octave scales or sequences in chords or things like this, rather than just voicing the top note, and making the musical choice to bring out different melodic lines, to bring out conversations, um, relieving the constancy of the same straining to voice the same finger, right? So this is, this is a solution that works really quite well, a musical decision that works quite well in relieving the stress. Um, and finally, finding interpretive justifications to find resting places, using breaths, using retardandos, using rests, all of these things, you know, breathe with your wrists, like Chopin said, avoid locking. So find, finding these resting places is so important when you're constantly stretched out with a small hand. The final point that I make here on my slide is to get to know your piano. Why is this important for pianists with small hands? It's because we need to memorize and refine our memory in the topography of the keyboard because we're constantly searching for the location of a key, right? If you, if you trust and you know where everything is under your fingers, this wastes much less energy, again, physical and mental energy. So spending the time with your students to uh, memorize the topography of the keyboard is really important. I have a friend who uses um, soccer drip, actually, I don't know if it's soccer or basketball, but dribbling glasses where th there's there are these goggles where there's a little piece of plastic that juts out right here. So when you're playing, you can't see your fingers, right? And so this is a good one for teachers to use when you're working with students that are always looking down, always questioning where the next jump and leap will be landing on. So work on this with your students and you'll see that the energy that they expend will be much, much less. 
Unfortunately, pianists have to adjust to new instruments all the time because we can't carry around a nine foot grant or any type of concert grant like a violinist can. And this, but this doesn't mean that we shouldn't get to know each instrument that we play on. And again, for pianists with small hands that are really working on the choreography and the knowledge of the piano, it's really important as teachers to stress this time that the student should spend with the instrument getting to know the weight of the keys, the depth of the keys, and even the size of the keys. My Yamaha Baby Grand that I grew up playing on has slightly smaller key widths than a Steinway D. And so just to know this and to get familiar with that. Um, so this, we're, you know, as pianists with small hands, we're constantly developing efficient strategies of motion, right? And this really relies on a constancy of the piano, different elements of the piano, a constancy in that. And so I can't stress this enough. So what can we do as teachers? What can we do? We can create a plan of action in the work to be done at the piano. So a plan of action to test out the characteristics and the idiosyncrasies of the instrument and also the acoustical environment to get used to it. So we can ask our students to use scales and slow chords to just start getting used to the piano. Um, this allows the observations to happen in a, a, a more emotionally void state, right? So that it allows for some clarity of thought. Um, when you, students are trying to pieces out to test them at slow tempos using soft volumes to figure out the adjustments in controlling the sound at a place of physical comfort is really important, not just to go for it um, using the previous uh, precepts of the piano at home, right? But what about in competitions or recitals when you can't try out the instrument? What do we do? And um, one strategy is to program less technically challenging pieces in the beginning that allows your, the pianist to get to know the instrument, right? So don't start out with Pedrushka. <laughs> um, start out with something that has maybe two voice counterpoint or slow tempos that are, are less challenging so that your student can really get to know the instrument and start to gauge how to control the instrument better. As well, if that isn't an option, perhaps to embrace more moderate tempos in the beginning, to apply softer choices in, in the interpretation, to find more spacing in breath and find more areas of rhythmic stretching in the beginning until your student and the pianist gains um, confidence and an acceptable level of understanding of the instrument. Basically take less risks in the beginning, right? So this is, a, a really great strategy in helping your small-handed pianists uh, perform on pianos that they don't know. And of course, we're back to the subject of choosing repertoire. So of course, choosing repertoire that's well matched for the student's personality, growth, and physical abilities and restrictions. There's a reason that I, my teacher didn't give me Petrushka when I was in high school. Um, but also to think about at the same time, the psyche of the pianist, right? Small-handed pianists come in all different shapes and sizes. And for instance, a student with small hands that is adept at jumping, right? Um, I can barely reach an octave chord, but I can jump around quite well. So in terms of playing something like Prokofiev or Liszt etudes or Chopin etudes, um, I can figure my way around that. And especially combined with my love of this particular music and my unfailing will to find a solution, right? All of this combined, um, I did, I played Prokofiev III when I was 16 years old and um, I played these types of repertoires. So don't only consider the physical restrictions, but also the psyche, the, the desires, the personalities of your students in choosing repertoire. So that's about it in terms of coping strategies. This has again been inspired by my own teaching and my own playing as well as updated research on technique. 
Um, I really hope that this exploration of individual formulas for your students can cross barriers to easy to expressive playing. There is, however, one last solution that I'd like to talk about that can revolutionize piano playing for people with small hands. I'll give you a little break from me and let this video by Linda Gould introduce the topic. Hi, my name is Linda Gould. My piano has a secret. Ready for the secret? Watch this. I can reach a tenth. And it's glorious. And in order to be able to play that Chopin etude, need to be able to reach a tenth in order to be able to comfortably access everything that Chopin has required of me. This is the size of your keyboard. Notice I've got the two black notes lined up here and these guys are a little bit spread out and look at how much difference there is. As a matter of fact, on this keyboard an octave is six and a half inches on my piano, an octave is five and a half inches. And there's about 200 of these in the world today. If you don't believe me, let me take you over to my husband's piano and I will show you that this is in fact the size of your keyboard. Okay, I've dismantled my phone and I'm gonna pick up my plastic keys, walk over to my husband's piano. Yes, we have his and hers pianos. And here he is. This is just like your piano. And I put my plastic keys up here and you will see that they line up beautifully. Most, if not all, concert pianists have the correct keyboard size for their hand because they have large hands. From the giant Oscar Peterson to tiny Alicia de la Rocha, they can all reach a tenth or more. And that seems to be the magic interval that determines if a professional concert career is possible. This is the distance that I can stretch on a regular size piano. I can barely reach a ninth. And this is the distance that I can stretch on my piano, a comfortable tenth. And this is the cast that I wore for three years when I couldn't play at all. But more about that later. I thought if I could show you myself playing a Chopin etude on both sized keyboards at the same time, it would be obvious what I was experiencing. Unfortunately, even if you slow this video down, it isn't obvious. A really experienced pianist, upon careful observation, can see a difference, but it isn't obvious. Small distances make a big difference when you're playing advanced repertoire. Small distances are the difference between playing a piece and not playing a piece, having a career and not having a career, enjoying Beethoven sonatas and jazzy tents, or struggling through them. hear it. Oops. When I first heard about this keyboard, 
my initial reaction was rather odd in retrospect. Oh, I don't need this keyboard. I can do just fine with the one that I have. But when I started to unpack my thoughts, I realized how absurd and masochistic my reaction was. When I bought a new bicycle last year, I didn't try on sizes that would have fit Franz Liszt, <laughs> the person responsible for standardizing the size of the keyboard. Of course, you can manage a larger bicycle, but it's so much harder. And why do it when there are other options? Before the standardization of the keyboard size, pianos ranged in an octave span from 125 to 170 millimeters. And they were often customized to the exact hand of the player. So piano manufacturers like Arard, Playel, and Steinway worked closely with sought out artists of the time, such as Franz Liszt, uh, Frederick Chopin, and uh, to standardize the keyboard to a size that suited these virtuosos. The piano's modifications were standardized in the 1850s and hasn't changed since then. The evolution of the piano perfectly suited the golden age of touring artists, which turned out, which churned out great artists like Buzzoni, like Courtois, Rachmaninoff, Horowitz, Michelangeli, all of whom possessed a reach of a tenth, like Linda Gould was speaking about. During the standardization of key sizes, it was unreasonable to consider the hand sizes of the few women that were pursuing performance careers. The social restrictions placed on women at the time prevented them from becoming anything but amateurs for the most part, thereby keeping their playing within the home. Today, according to a survey by Christopher Donison in 2000, universities in North America have a ratio of eight females for every one male piano student. Modern research on hand sizes show us that the female hand is 15% smaller than the male on average. The piano is adapted for the large concert hall, the traveling piano virtuoso, the new concert public, the amateur musician, and the rise of music lessons. Now the piano world must bend to finally make way for the female professional. The Stein Bueller company has been manufacturing reduced size keyboards or ergonomically scaled keyboards like this one here in front of you or the DS standard since 1994. They currently offer two sizes of keyboards that are 7 8 and 15 16 the size of a standard keyboard. They're customized and sold separately to fit in any grand piano without any compromise in sound or response. You can buy one. Um, I, this is a Halun upright piano, um, like you see here, for about eleven thousand dollars, fitted with the the sizes that I just mentioned. As well, the Cunningham Piano Company in Philadelphia makes Yamaha pianos with ergonomically scaled keyboards. There are also a few makers around the country taking on commissions to build custom keyboards. If you're interested in trying one out, paskpiano.org, P-A-S-K piano.org, lists many schools that house these keyboards. And as well, they list private owners that are willing to share their instruments for use. I personally played on one at the Banff Center in Canada, as well as in a private home of a teacher in Portland. It was amazing how quickly I adjusted to the size of the keyboard. I had been preparing um, in Portland, for example, a program that had a lot of technically challenging pieces on it. The Stravinsky Etudes, um, R Ravel, Scarbo, things like this. And I, my thoughts were, oh, it's going to take me a while to adjust, but I played with it for about 20, 30 minutes, and I was able to, to keep my tempo to, and to more easily play these pieces and suddenly have so many more options in my music making, in the expression, in the choices that I made because of the ease that I was feeling 
um, in playing a keyboard that fit my head. It was amazing to me. And although this technology has been available for many, many years, only nine universities in the United States house one. And the lack of availability and even the knowledge of its existence is unacceptable. There's so much potential and enjoyment that is lost for smaller handed pianists in this world without this keyboard, this size keyboard that can suit the individual. And it, not, it doesn't only pertain to women, but also to men with small hands and to children, right? The violin has many sizes that um, a child starts out with and grows and chooses a new one, right? So of course, this is an expensive endeavor if you're talking about changing keyboards, but I don't think that it should stop um, larger institutions and schools from housing them. According to Steinbühler and several piano technicians that I've spoken with, there's no compromise of sound or power when using a reduced size keyboard. The touch and response of the keys can be adjusted to the user. And what I found most surprising was that it can be taken out and the, the original action can be taken out and replaced with a reduced size action in only a few minutes. And any piano technician can do it and you can even do it. And um, most importantly, pianists won't need to make any musical concessions with the, with the um, use of an ergonomically scaled keyboard, a keyboard that fits their own hand. Music in our current state of affairs is more important than ever. It's core to our humanity. It has the power to hold us up during hard times. Therefore, now more than ever, practices in inclusivity and the support of universal accessibility is incredibly important. There's always a better way, an easier way, a more expressive way in continuing our musical journeys. So let's practice some inclusivity as teachers by exploring these solutions with our students who come in all shapes and all sizes with a thirst for all types of music. Thank you so much for having me. If you would like to have a conversation on this topic, please feel free to visit my website, tinachong.ca, I'm Canadian, and reach out. Thanks again and goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and more importantly, I hope it will be useful in your teaching.